Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays edition 114. Um, today uh, we have got how to make food safety learning fun and effective and uh, it's with don't tell anybody my favorite uh, presenter Dr. David Rosenblatt from uh, Share Consulting and Training. We, we will introduce you to David shortly, but uh, a few uh, housekeeping things first. Uh, obviously, some of you know uh, the chat bar and the sidebar. Type in there, tell us where you're from, and uh, yeah, well, we can see what you're called. But uh, yeah, tell us where you're, you're watching us from today. Um, it is being recorded today. Uh, every every Food Safety Fridays webinar uh, afterwards, we'll send all of you an email with the uh, slide deck and uh, the recording and the certificate. So if you miss a bit, uh, don't worry. Um, you will be able to catch up later. Uh, yeah, the sponsors. This is sponsored Food Safety Fridays. We wouldn't be here without our sponsors, and they are Safe Food 360, Trace Analytics, AIB International, DNV GL Business Assurance and Metal of Toledo. So thank you to our kind sponsors. Uh, we've got a good crowd today. I think we've got uh, around 1,500 people registered. So looking forward to a, a very engaging presentation from David. And are you there, David? Ta -da. Hello, everybody. Are you there, Switch? Can you Please. hear me? Can you see me? Can hear you, can see you loud and clear. Okay. Nice to have you with us again, David. Hi, Simon. Hello, everybody. Are you well? Yeah, perfect. Raring to excited go. For the, excited about the webinar. Great. Okay, well, if you can get your slides up, David, uh, I'll tell the audience about what we've got coming up next week. Um, yes, next week, Sustainable Food Production and Sourcing Standards with Tom Gosselin, he's Director of Sustainability and supply chain services at DNVGL Business Assurance. So you can uh, click in the sidebar there and register, just very easy and simple to do. If not, follow up on one of our emails that we'll be sending over the coming week. Uh, I'll be back later on, uh, but for now, I'll hand you over to David. Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're gonna start out today with a riddle. So. We're gonna have to, you're gonna have to open or help me open the safe. The secrets of learning are hidden within. Find the four digits and you can get in. H U S from you know what a killer bug in bovine gut. So if you know the answer to the riddle, type it into the sidebar, Ooh. and then we can proceed because I can't proceed without the secrets of learning are hidden, are, are hidden within. Mm. The secrets of learning are hidden within. Find the four digits and you can get in. H-U-S from you know what. A killer bug in bovine gut. Ooh. E. coli. Oh, oh, Beth. All right. 0157. Do you want to give it a try? 0157. There Boom. you go. Uh, you've opened <laughs> the safe. There's 0157 in the safe. So... That just, uh, uh, I just want to demonstrate for you all a little uh, fun way to start a presentation or start a, a training session. Um, I know the O is not the digit zero, okay? Don't get, you know, but it's still fun. Um, so um, we're going to be talking about um, training or what I prefer to call learning. And, um, and and we're going to talk about this little uh, riddle and, and and opening the safe thing a little bit further down. So just a little demo there for you. Um, so why do we need food safety training? That's the first question we're going to address. And the answer is we do not need food safety training. We don't. Um, so uh, this I hope you're not surprised. So if we don't need food safety training, I guess we can all just uh, proceed to have fun with the weekend. And uh, so thank you. And it was a pleasure talking to you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Everybody's fine. Okay. We're gonna, well, so we don't. What do we need, though? We need safe food. We don't need training. We don't need learning. We don't need education. We need safe food. And that has to be kept in mind at all times when we're talking about food safety learning and culture and education. Um, training, um, engaging the employees is not... Um, it is not a, 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 an objective uh, on, on its own. Um, 
if we can, uh, uh, if we could have, if we could obtain safe food without training anybody, it would be fine. But the truth is, we need safe food. In order to obtain safe food, we need employees to behave safely, and there's no way to get around that. And if we need employees to behave safely, then we need employee competence and awareness. And if we need employee competence and awareness, then I guess we need to effectively deliver the competence and awareness. So it's about safe food eventually, and all of our training techniques, whatever they will be, and we'll be talking about a few today, um, are just the means to get there. Um, and I want to recap, if you, um, and I do encourage you to go back to some of my previous presentations um, about um, the theory behind um, human behavior and employee, food employee behavior. We're just going to recap on, on the two major subjects. Um, and one is competence, and the other would be awareness. Just want to remind you that if we want somebody to do something, if wash their hands, fill out a form, test the metal detector, close the door, um, calibrate the measuring equipment, um, if we need anybody to do anything like that, then that person um, must be competent to do it. And competence is uh, is a person that knows what to do and how to do it, and then they're competent. So we're talking about knowledge and capability. Um, and part of our employee education program is to deliver competence, um, to teach people what has to be done and how to do it. But I just want to emphasize that a big part of our training program is aimed at awareness. And I will often enter a, an employee classroom um, and say, good morning, everybody. Hi, how you doing? Um, my name is David, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm not going to teach you anything new today. And that gets people a little surprised. Um, and I said, if, I, if, if you need me to come to your factory and meet you people and tell you what and how to do your job, then we're in big trouble. You know how to do your job. And you know what to do. Um, but I would like the opportunity to enter into your little brains and walk around your little head and do some work there and do some cleaning up and some sweeping and some dusting. Um, and that's what we're talking about, the why. Because um, people who know why we want them to do something will do it. If they don't know why, they won't. Or they may not. Um, and this is actually um, embedded in the requirements of ISO 22000 and ISO 9001 as well. If you go to the um, clause that deals with, um, in the ISO re standard, if you go to the clause that deals with um, resources, what uh, ISO calls support, and look at um, 7.2, it's called um, competence, 7.3 called awareness. And it says, employees must be aware of the company's policy, of its uh, um, objectives. The employees must be aware of um, their, uh, um, of, of, of the consequences of their job, how they affect the safety of the food chain, and if they um, don't do their job properly, what are the consequences? Um, so a lot of uh, talking to employees is, is getting them on board. Um, and also we're going to be talking about, we're talking about uh, um, training techniques and having making it fun and entertaining and effective. We have to understand that part of uh, motivation, besides being aware and understanding why, is also relatedness to the organization. I'm going to be talking a little bit that further down, but the self-determination theory um, that um, talks about the importance of relatedness and motivation um, should be recapped if you're not on board with that, and you should go back to one of the previous webinars and, and talk about that. Um, okay, um, so who doesn't hear me? Zodi Solomon can hear. Any other problems? Just want to make sure it's not a or it's not a problem for everybody. Uh, no, uh, David. Um, I, I'll tell you. I just wanted to. We've got three hundred and fifty on online. It's just one or okay. two people. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm so going to go on. So, um, so I want to. I focus on learning environments. We meet our employees for what we call training um, in uh, several different and in possible environments: um, the classroom, online. 
outdoor, and on the job. So that's where we're going to. That those are the environments we'll be doing our uh, education and learning. Um, classroom could be a real classroom. It could be the mess hall. It could be an improvised um, uh, hangar that we've uh, prepared for for to do some training because we don't have a training room. But it's classroom. It's 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 a teacher in front of people who came to study. Um, on the job is more one on one or one on two, one on three. I'm showing people how it's done, talking to them. On the job, outdoor is um, we do a lot of um, outdoor, and I mean outdoor, I mean in nature or in the city environment, outside the plant. Um, usually, things having to do with uh, fun, um, getting people to uh, relate to the company and its uh, and its policies, company values, and a lot of training is now done online, like we're doing now. 352 people spending Friday morning, afternoon, evening, learning about learning, sitting in front of their computer. So more and more training is being done online. Um, the short session we have together today um, doesn't allow me to effectively um, talk about each one of these four environments, but I do have a lot to say about all of them. Uh, so I chose to focus on classroom. From my experience, um, even though we're seeing more and more online, still over 50% of training is done um, in classroom situation, especially with um, with employees um, who do uh, manual labor. Um, the food industry is typically, um, we're talking about um, manual labor employees. Um, they don't have access to computers all the time. Um, and the uh, the possibilities of doing online are not as developed in other, as in other um, parts of our industry. So I'm going to be talking about classroom. So I hope you're all happy with that. Um, and I'm just going to proceed this. Okay. So this is our typical classroom, and I want to talk about a few things going on in a classroom to make our training fun, uh, engaging and people wanting to come for training. So first of all, we want to set up a festive atmosphere. Um, make it fun. Decorate the room. Make it beautiful. It shouldn't be something that's done in a messy environment. Make sure everything is clean. Um, and make sure there's some music playing in the background and motivational music, energizing music. I always do that when I have a classroom of people coming in. Whenever somebody comes in, smile at them, walk up to them, greet them, shake their hand. Um, ask them how they're doing. Tell them how excited you are about the fun training we're going to be having today and how, how appreciative you are that they came to listen to you. Um, so just make it festive. Make it make it a happening, uh, and, and that's uh, uh, that will start it off. Next, make sure training comes with classy refreshments. I'm talking about, you know, not regular donuts and coffee, but make it fun. Make, it, uh, make people feel that they're appreciated um, and that we're pampering them. So I'm not uh, boring, um, and of course, not saying you know you don't get anything because because uh, we ran out of budget or whatever. Whatever money you put into training will come back. I promise. Um, remember, this is really important information. If you're going to take one thing from this webinar, remember the cost of training is not the cost of the refreshments of the trainer. Of the uh, uh, of the activities of the of the written material, that's not the cost. Yes, you can pay thousands of dollars for that, um, and thank God I that's why that's, well, that's uh, how I make my living. Um, but that's not the cost. The cost is the number of people times the hours of training that they're not working, and that is the real cost. And if the training is not going to be effective, you're going to be saving a few dollars. Um, on a trainer or on a material uh, or on refreshments because you're low on budget, it's not worth it. Um, it's it's negligible next to the cost you're paying for these people to be in the classroom instead of being on their jobs. Um, so classy refreshments. Three, the story. Always use a story. Um, and if, it, if it's a funny story, that's even better. Um, and I'm going to talk about the story a little bit. 
to give you an example, this is just an example that I, um, uh, I made up for this webinar. Um, free, feel free to use it. Uh, I'd be happy. Um, so employees come into training. They think it's going to be something boring. They heard something about food safety. They don't know exactly what. And then there's a story, and we show them Timothy. He suffers from bacteriophobia. That's something I made up. I don't know if it maybe maybe somebody maybe people do have bacteriophobia, but I made that up. He thinks his food has been mishandled, and he's afraid to eat. Your mission is to prove to Timothy there's nothing to worry about. And now we start the training. The training is not going to be me teaching you stuff. It's going to be us solving um, puzzles, running around, doing a treasure hunt, going from place to place, opening a safe. And and little by little, we're going to prove to Timothy that he can trust us. I'll give you another example that I made up for this webinar. You can also use that if you want. Um, the world needs our help. An underground anarchistic organization released the following threat. Okay, this is a ransom note type font. Prove the food supply chain can be trusted within the next 90 minutes or we will release a chemical that makes all of the food in the world taste the same. So, um, and, then, and from now on, we're going to be running around and solving puzzles and proving. So it's always about having fun, uh, playing games, solving puzzles, solving riddles. Um, that have that that are all based on the fact that if I know my job well, if I'm good at what I do, then I can solve the puzzle. Now, of course, um, we're going to be teaching things as we go along, but the learning is going to be, um, it's going the learning is going to be um, registered with the learners as part of the fun. They won't even they won't even realize they're learning, and as they proceed. And we can have a competition, and maybe we can give out a prize. So that's the idea of a story. Have a story, and sometimes we do a story that um, goes on for um, for months in an organization. I can tell you about one case study we did with a big dairy company, um, and the story was well, the, the employees had five training sessions. Um, we, they were each one of the training sessions was like 90 minute training, um, hands on, uh, fun, uh, competitive training in small groups. And they had one of these sessions every three to four weeks, um, multiplied by five or six times. So this goes on for a few months. And the whole training idea had a story, um, that, that the organization, um, uh, that there's a crazy professor telling people not to trust the dairy industry, um, that the dairy industry doesn't know what they're doing and they can't be trusted, and everybody should buy a cow. Um, every family should have a cow in their backyard. They should milk their own cows. They should make their own dairy products. And this big dairy company, all their employees, um, went on a mission with for a few months to prove um, to people that they can trust them, and, the, and they went with the slogan, don't buy a cow. Don't buy a cow. Don't buy a cow. You can, and they had um, signs and they had campaigns, and it was all part of the game. And as we went along, we proved to the people um, that uh, we know our job, we know food safety, we know the, the golden rules. Uh, we can we recognize uh, um, uh, nonconformity. We understand the importance of it. So what I would have been giving frontal training, boring PowerPoint presentation, is now being delivered through. A fun game, and uh, and and every time they met, we spoke about where we are now. So now the people understand that they can trust us to do this and this, but they're still worried about that. So now we go on to our next mission, and we do another puzzle, uh, or, or or solve another mystery. So that's just the the, the fun of it. Um, so that's a story. You can make up any story. Next, I want to talk about the presentation because I think that uh, I still think, and I, I just recently gave a seminar on um, uh, in uh, in a quality conference um, under the title "How to Be an Edutainer." An edutainer is an is an edu an entertaining educator. Um, people who come to training they want to be entertained while they're being educated. And I think we can do that. So just and and I am I I've I've been doing this for. I've been training since I've used um, uh, overhead projector slides, handwritten. Um, and I've gone through every um, technology available to deliver training. And my 
Um, my personal conclusion is that PowerPoint is the king. I know people talk about Prezi and Google Slides and all kinds of alternatives, and PowerPoint has been said to be boring and outdated. It's not. PowerPoint has unbelievable, um, and I don't get any money from PowerPoint, so I'm not, you know, I'm not endorsing them. Uh, I really think that it does the job, and we can have a lot of fun using it. So if people are sitting and and watching something, um, then they should be watching a good presentation. I'm going to give you some presentation tips. Um, that are adapted to the current learner. So here's a picture. Thanks to Food Safety Fridays, your presentations won't be boring anymore. These two cute little slides that I made, I'm going to go back one. Okay, alphabet soup um, with Food Safety Fridays in there, and then I made up this little thing in a fortune cookie. Um, we can uh, now, using the web, um, make beautiful messages that are funny and, and fun instead of boring ways of saying things. So that was just an example. Um, I To do these two little uh, magic tricks, I used a tool that's called Image Chef. Um, yay, Image Chef. Again, I don't, I don't get anything from them. I'm endorsing them because I love to use it. It's just um, dozens and dozens of templates that you can use uh, you can write in all different languages and put text into, into wonderful pictures and use it in your presentations to make it fun and engaging and, and just nice. And another thing that, um, that I'm going to talk about in, in fun presentations is, uh, is participation. Um, I just, uh, I, I've been using, um, audience participation for a long time since it's been invented. Um, oh, there you go. Simon, you put on the link. That's pretty nice. Um, I just, um, in the re in recent year, I, um, um, I managed to convince the university that I teach at to use, um, one of the integrated, um, um, uh, one of the integrated, um, um, programs that allow you to do live polling while, during lesson, I'm using smartphones. And um, and just got my um, we just finished our for the first semester and I got my student feedback, um, and the students were so happy. I was surprised because, um, you know, they were doing it in the class. They were having fun, but when they when they took the time to write in their feedback, um, in their uh, they all the students fill out feedback questionnaires when the semester is over. They loved that engagement. They said it helped them learn. Um, so let's do one. I have one for you. Um, just to, to um, demonstrate what I mean when I say live polling during a presentation. So here we go. How we have a so just a live poll. What how how do you feel about Image Chef? And you have A B C D. And let's see how you feel. And we can talk about that. So I'm going to put on my polling. There it is. You all have to vote. Yep, I've, I've loaded the poll in the sidebar. If anybody loses sound or video, just click reconnect or failing that, just close the webinar window and then rejoin on the same link from your email. Um, yeah, you don't have to type B in. Um, Jamie, if, if it reconnect doesn't work, close the window and reopen again. Oh, can't use it site block by God for IT. Uh, Okay, uh, vote in the poll. You don't don't need to type in. Um, okay. No, it's a good um, it's a good res resource. That is it free or do you have to pay for it today? No, it's free. Um, it's free. Okay, yeah. So a free free site that you can grab images and make your yeah, own. It's, it, and it's like not that. the only one, but it's the one I like. So it has a lot of good templates. Yeah. Um, okay. So okay, so um, uh, I'm glad that nobody wrote D. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. If if you think so, I appreciate not being truthful because I wouldn't. Know, but I'd watch. But so you had a little fun there. You 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 participate. You're not just listening. You're actively participating. We do that in the classroom as well. We have um, a bunch of tools available to do that. I want to talk. I want to. I'll I'll mention three. Um, and I'll show a little video now that I want Simon can put up. Um, that will um talk about one of the one of the first tools that I uh, use for polling in within PowerPoint. So um, let's pull everywhere. Just give me a second. 
So we're going to watch a little, a little YouTube video that they put up there. They don't even know I'm doing this. I, again, um, it's, I just love using it, so I tell people about it. Okay. For two minutes, it is the video. I'm playing it now. So you're giving a presentation, and you want to get some feedback from your audience. Show of hands. How many of you signed up for office hours? One, two, four, four two, fifth. That's not very accurate. Old voting methods take far too long, and expensive voting systems like this one, well, they're difficult to set up and don't allow for audience comments. Hello? Oh, nope, nothing. Introducing Poll Everywhere. Through a simple web interface, Poll Everywhere lets you collect instant audience feedback. Just type in a question, and your audience can respond using laptops, tablets, or even mobile phones. Even your crappy flip phone. Hey guys, what do you think of my presentation so far? Is it A, amazing, B, incredibly amazing, or C, not that great? To respond, just text message the number on screen or use a custom URL to respond in the web app. You can even use Twitter if that's what you're into. As people respond, results are embedded instantly into your presentation, in real time. Seriously, guys? You can also ask open-ended questions. What is your favorite part of my outfit? Poll Everywhere also lets you customize the look of your charts to wow your audience. And for all you spreadsheet nerds out there, you can even create segmented cross-tab analytics. The best part about it is, you can try it today for free. So how excited are you guys about Poll Everywhere? A. Can't contain it. Or B. Not at all. Kaboom! Instant audience feedback. Poll Everywhere. Okay, I like the guy. Um, so Paul Everywhere is a tool. It's um, if you can use it for free for a minute for a, for a limited number of uh, people. Um, if you do want to use it professionally and you need more people and you want to get more things, you can, you have to pay for it. It's affordable in my opinion and it's worth it. Um, another tool that you can use in uh, in PowerPoint is Participol. Um, I use Participol a lot. Um, uh, because our university uh has has a deal with them, so. It's embedded in our um, university software, but um, it's it does less stuff than, than Poll Everywhere. It's uh, a little bit less. Um, Poll Everywhere really does everything, especially um, you can get feedback on the screen. You can have open-end questions. It's fun. Another tool that is really uh, uh, fun to play with is Kahoot. Um, Kahoot allows you to do trivia. Uh, people can make up their own questions. You can have a competition. Um, the only drawback with Kahoot and that's totally uh, uh, circumventable is that it doesn't embed into PowerPoint. So if you're using a PowerPoint presentation and you want to do Kahoot, you have to go out and back in. So it's good as a, if you're not doing PowerPoint, you just want to have like a game, like a trivia game. Um, everybody uses their smartphones and uh, and you put up questions. You can put in music and movies. Um, it's a really good tool. Kahoot is also um, the basic version is free. Um, and as all three of these um, the tools, um, you can start up free, and then uh, the, the 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 payment is not uh, it, it, it's affordable uh, for for what it gives you in a presentation, and everybody has lots of fun doing it. Um, okay, um, I do want to. So we're talking. I talked about the story. I talked about the presentation. A lot of other stuff I can talk about in presentations. Um, just if it's worth mentioning. Uh, make sure PowerPoint presentations have minimal words, maximum pictures, movies, um, jokes, things going on. The words themselves are not the issue. I know um, for many presenters, the words help the presenter remember what to say, and I appreciate that. And uh, for less experienced presenters, that's really, really important. Um, please know that PowerPoint will allow you to present um, if you are standing with your computer facing you, you can have your speaker notes available to you and the audience won't see them. So that will solve your problem of not remembering what you wanted to say or if there's a specific term that you want that you're afraid you're going to forget or some numbers that you're not clear on. You can you have your, your little cheat sheet 
in front of you. Nobody knows, and it doesn't have to clutter, clutter up your your presentation screen. Um, if you do want information for people that to have to learn um, actual figures, numbers, uh, um, things that they instructions, then give handouts um, or send people by email things to read. They're not going to remember what they're reading um, during the presentation. Um, next, I want to a little bit talk about video. Video is uh, uh, really fun to use in present in presenting. Um, I use video in different sources. Um, I use a lot of um, humor, um, sitcom, stand-up comedy skits. I'm always watching and listening and things that have to do with food safety, um, funny things going on. Um, Seinfeld has a great um, uh, episode where he um, Seinfeld and uh, he goes with his girlfriend to eat pizza at her at her dad's, um, um, uh, and Steinfeld and Poppy meet in the toilet, um, and Poppy doesn't wash his hands, and then uh, Seinfeld's reaction to him not washing his hands is hilarious. So just as a to start up a discussion about hand washing, why people don't wash their hands, you can use that. There's a great little scene um, from Ratatouille, the movie about the. Um, uh, but Remy the rat, who is a chef, and at one point, and there's a scene where all the rat, all the rat friends come to help him in the kitchen, and they all uh, wash their hands. So it's just great fun watching, you know, seeing showing a, a cartoon of cats of rats washing their hands and stuff like that. So a lot of um, a uh, uh, lot, lot of um, videos coming from sitcom stand-up comedy, um, food reality shows. Um, they're all over the place. If you want, when you watch them. Look for um, mistakes that people make. Um, they do it all the time. You can use that. Show just uh, 10 minutes of uh, one of your favorite food reality shows, um, a competition of cooking, My Kitchen Rules, Master Chef, whatever is on your country. Um, and you'll see within 10 minutes of video, you'll be able to identify three to four um, food safety violations and then have people talk about them and tell different, talk about the difference between um, uh, between a reality show, which is not reality, and and real working in the kitchen, um, just an example. Um, I use the news all the time. Um, whenever I talk about a food safety hazard, I will show a news clip, um, and they're abundant. Um, that's where it gets less funny, of course. If food safety is we can we can have fun while we're teaching it, but it's a very very serious issue. Um, and I have no problem showing a news clip about children who were injured because of their food or an allergic reaction that caused somebody severe uh, damage or even death and how it was how it was reported um, just to keep things actual up to date and real um, some video tools that are really easy to use and a lot of people I'm surprised to find out don't know about them um, YouTube um, you can um, embed. Uh, so, thing with, thing with YouTube, if you want to watch it like we did now, um, this platform doesn't allow to embed YouTube inside the platform. So, it's not a big deal. Simon had to go out, um, uh, you know, put in the video and then watch it and then go back. It's not, it's not a big deal, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't flow well. Well, YouTube allows you to embed a video inside your PowerPoint presentation. You can size it, put it wherever size you want, put it wherever you want. Um, it's a great tool. Um, the only problem with that is if you don't have a good video, a good internet connection while you're presenting, you'll get stuck. So you should always have a backup plan. Um, convert um, a YouTube online video to an MPR, MP4 um, a format that can be used. Um, of course, uh, you want to um, respect all um, copyright and uh, whatever. Um, when you're using uh, those types of tools, you want to respect permissions and copyrights. Uh, but you can, any YouTube uh, video can be converted to MP4. And then when you use MP4 in PowerPoint, you can do whatever you want. Um, it's so much fun. Um, so you can edit it. Um, you, can, you can decide when you want it to start, when you want it to end by using the trim video. Anybody can do it. I'm talking about people who are not computer savvy. It's really it is intuitive. And it's and it's fun. What I do, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a, a one of the CSI Miami episodes. Um, 
dealt with a E. coli um, infection. Um, and it was a big mystery. A girl that died from E. coli and did this whole um, CSI uh, on, on that. So I just took a portion of that and used it uh, in PowerPoint, showing them, and up to a point, then it stops. And then I put in a poll uh, after the video. Uh, pause the video, put in a poll, and say, what do you think is going to happen now? And everybody guesses, and they're having fun, it's going this and that, and then you go in and continue your PowerPoint presentation, and you see how it ends. So you can do stuff like that. It's real, real easy. Um, and uh, people have fun watching. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about activities. So I'm give you some ideas for activities um, to make learning more fun. Um, one of them we saw when I started out. We had a little riddle. It had rhymes going on. By the way, if you like it, you can use it. I made it up for this for this webinar. Um, and um, so yeah, to open a safe to, to try to do some. I'll talk a little bit about activities that I like. Um, One activity that I really like to do with employees is um, we call it tomorrow's headline. Um, and what we do, if, if, I, if I have an, a possibility, what we do is talk about what we call the pyramid effect. This is a whole idea in food safety saying that every little nonconformity, every little um, hazard at the bottom of the pyramid, like an open door or water on the floor or a leaky pipe or rust or, um, or improvised um, engineering, uh, fixing stuff with... Um, with tape and, car and cardboard, all those little tiny things that we see all the time, and we're trying to um, we're trying to, to prevent. Each one of them has the potential um, to end up with a catastrophe, um, but usually they don't. So the rule the rule is when we're trying to teach us to employees is we can live with these nonconformities every day, and nothing might happen. But we are um, rolling the dice, and we do not have. Uh, the right to roll the dice. We're talking about people's health um, and their own lives, and, and that's something we can't do. But people must be able to understand the potential of every one of these little tiny nonconformities uh, um, because every headline in food safety, every big recall, every catastrophe, when you, when you um, analyze it, you will get to the bottom of that pyramid. So what we do is we talk about that theory um, the way I do it is I show a picture of an open door. I usually try to shoot a picture of an open door in the plant or in the factory or in the catering company or in the warehouse or in the packing house, doesn't wherever I'm teaching. Um, just one, catch one door. Don't open a door for that. Just there's there are enough people who do that violation to have one open. If not, then somebody else's plant. And then and, and say, what is this? What do you see here? And I was, oh, it's an open door. I said, that, what you're seeing here is a hazard. And then I put a little rat or a mouse or a pigeon behind the door outside peeking in. I use a, a PowerPoint, and then everybody gets all, you know, everybody thinks that's you know, really funny. Um, then I say, okay, what is the hazard now? And the question that people will say is, well, the hazard now is that there's a pigeon or there's a, there's a rat. And I said, no, that's not the hazard. The pigeon and the rat are outside. That's fine. That's where they live. The, still, the hazard is that, the, that the, the door is open. And is that rat going to enter into that plant? What do you think? And everybody says, yes, yes. And I said, no, the answer, the answer is, and the only answer is, we don't know. It's yes or no, it's a maybe. And we cannot afford that maybe. And then, of course, the next slide is in, the, the, we, you know, I introduce the, the pest into the plant, show a picture of it, and then go up that pyramid um, step by step. Okay, now the fact that there's a pigeon flying around in the warehouse, does that mean there's going to be pigeon poop on our on our products, the answer is I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. Then if there is, does that mean there's going to be contamination? Maybe yes, maybe no. So forth and so on. until the, and the final question is, does that mean somebody is going to die from salmonella poisoning? And the answer is we don't know. Every time somebody gets injured or or, or, or ill, or so every time somebody there's a recall or a terrible um, uh, um, uh, social media crisis because somebody took a, a, a picture of something. All of these started with somebody doing something wrong. So now that people know that, then we play the game tomorrow's headline. Send the people to the factory in little teams of three or four. Um, they have to snap a picture. And if they're not allowed to do that, just describe a picture of what they saw, something that they saw, come back and make up tomorrow's headline uh, in the newspaper. 
and that and that allows them to be creative to th and to connect to think about the con the potential consequences of um of the way they the food safety is managed in the cold food safety culture in the plant it's a really it's a really successful uh, um activity uh it gets people up and out and running around and uh, not running uh, walking around and, and and thinking and thinking um another activity that i like is um activity i call a treasure hunt and it's just a series of riddles and puzzles and thinking uh, games that it was the people doing teams uh, against each other in a competition to proceed uh, on a hunt to to solve a mystery or to find a, a combination uh, or to find the hidden the hidden message it doesn't matter and um and in the end while you're going through this series of walking around the plan maybe going to the yard maybe going to human resources asking them the question try to make it engaging and fun um, as they proceed, of course, they have to use their skills and their knowledge. And, and if they don't know, then they have to buy a hint, and so forth. And we, and a lot, oftentimes, we'll use um, language or graphics that are familiar to people from TV reality shows, depending on what's popular in that country at that time. Maybe the people are now it's popular to watch The Amazing Race, um, that type of activity, or survival, or uh, survival. Survivors, one of those. So whatever is, is popular for people, and it, it makes them, and they have fun doing it. Um, third activity I wanted to tell you about um, is food safety mysteries. We we do these all the time, um, and this is done uh, in a classroom. Um, what we do is we, we uh, make up a, a food safety story that is based on a real story, something that happened, and then make uh, five to seven uh, people who are involved. It's sort of like, it, 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 it's played out like a, like a murder mystery type of a game. Everybody gets a card that tells them who they are, their identity, and what they know. And every one of the people in the game knows something else that happened. One of them was the shift manager. One of them was the QA manager. One of them was the employee on the line. And and so there are five, or, five to seven of these roles, and the people sit down, and they have to Together, they have to figure out what went wrong, how people became sick, how come this product left the plant, and of course, it's always a uh, with, uh, there's always a lot of information that throws them off the track, and they have to talk to each other. And the game is everybody is, uh, everybody has a part in the in what happened. Everybody has their own part in what happened. Everybody contributed in some way, but nobody wants to get blamed. So it's like a fun way of doing uh, of talking about food safety, and then they have to put together the mystery. And and eventually um, say what they would have done differently or what they think would be the proper proper corrective action for that plant. Of course, it's always a different plant. It's never our plant, but the reference is always clear. It, it's always is something that we can relate to in our plant. Um, I have a whole bank of these food for safety mysteries that I wrote for different types of industries and different types of of employee levels and different types of food safety hazards. Sometimes a customer says, uh, "We want to." Um, we want to people be to me be more aware of the of allergen protection, allergen uh, procedures. So the mystery will be an allergic mystery. And if somebody say we are having problems with, you know, management will tell me we're having problems with people uh, with hand washing, then we'll make it a hand washing mystery. But uh, it's just a fun way. One of the uh, uh, the the good things about these mysteries is 100% participation. You don't get that in many activities because everybody has a role. So let's say you have you let's say you have a group of 30 employees then you you know then you just have uh six groups of five um and every single person has a role so if there's one person who's usually less participant doesn't speak the language that well tends to you know go out and smoke while everybody's they you can't they won't be able to solve the mystery without him so it, it, it's a way of uh, of um of encouraging people activity number four is a is a make a movie activity. I really like this one. And um, what we'll do is, um, if we're talking about a food safety training, then um, and we'll talk about, for instance, the ten or eight or seven or eleven um, golden rules that are mandatory in our plant. Um, uh, always wash your hands and sanitize your hands. Always take your uh, lab coat off when you go to the bathroom. Always uh, never do this. Always that, so forth. And then um, tell the people that the that um, management um, decided to fire the um, 
PR company that we work with or some kind of store, funny story like that. And we have to prepare our training uh, video for the new employees. So every little team has to take one of the um, uh, golden rules and make a one minute or 30 second commercial um, talking to people about how to behave and why it's important. And these are, and this little video is then, of course, they do it on their smartphones. I mean, it's not perfect. You, you can, we have done it with professional um, uh, suppliers of uh, professional uh, media. It costs a little money. It was nice, but you can do it on the smartphones. And then everybody sends their smartphone during using WhatsApp or using something, and they all put, and all the movies come together. And then you just, and, and within uh, 90 minutes, you have a four minute video of training for new employees where the employees themselves are doing the training and and we and then you use it and everybody and everybody and everybody's engaged it's just a fun way of of talking about food about food safety and making them think about how to talk about the issues um so i'm out of time right so that's just a, a few ideas of having of making um training fun simon are you with me Hello. Always. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Any... I'm here. Yeah. Switch your webcam back on. Um... Oh yeah. Well. Okay. Hello. Hey, hey. There we are. Sorry. Yep. Right. Um, let's get rid of the presentation. There we are. Thanks for that, okay. David. Okay. I see a lot of people who are excited about stuff. Um, I unfortunately a lot of the things we work with are of course um. Uh, um, copyright protected um, in, that we use for our trainings, um, but there are some there is some stuff I can share. If anybody wants to correspond with me, did, did Simon? Do people to, can people contact me directly? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, yeah, I can what include you? your uh, contact details so, in the yeah, So, email. so if, if somebody wants something specific, I, and then we'll see what you need to see how I can help. Um, because a lot of this stuff, as I said, has been developed uh, by us, and and uh, and I don't have permission to give it away, but we'll see what we can do. Um, okay. But it, but take the ideas, and um, anybody can do it. And of course, you can always uh, you can always hire learning specialists to do the kind of stuff uh, a lot of companies do. But a lot a lot of the people we work with, we um, uh, we coach them on how to do it, and then do it themselves. And they have a lot of fun. Yeah, so, Jeffrey's, um, Jeffrey's come up with a little idea. Scooby Doo, I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for those snooping auditors. <laughs> sure, but that's something you could work with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about Bruce? He's saying, what about if you have to train uh, the leadership team? Would they respond to this type of thing? Are they human? Are they. <laughs> Um, yes, the um, when I, I I always always make sure when I do no matter even I'm doing leadership teams even top management I always put a little fun in I always use um, uh, um, a little bit of engagement but the ratio between theory real teaching and um, and fun is is higher towards the teaching when I'm talking with people who are used to sitting in a classroom I mean when I do food when I do you know pathogen training for food technologists. Then I use videos and I use some jokes and everything, but most of it is science learning, like in university learning. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, any any, I mean, my I teach in the veterinary school, um, two classes, um, mandatory classes for veterinary students, um, and they have so much fun. Even though we go through very very difficult academic uh, uh, academic um, stuff, that uh, some of it's not not trivial, they still have so much fun while they're learning it because there's a way to teach everything in a fun way. Okay. Um, yeah, one one of the uh, attendees just mentioned having a Kaizen event is a good idea as well um, for, for learning together. Yeah, Kaizen is uh, Kaizen events are great. Um, they can also be really fun. I'm all for it. I think you know, I think that um, um, that engaging education goes hand in hand with the operational excellence and all the tools that are out there. Doing five S's, doing Kaizen's, um, uh, improvement teams, uh, things we've talked about in these presentations in the past. Sure. Yeah, that was uh, Robert Brown, by the way, credited to Robert. Uh, Samuel, uh, we should create a WhatsApp group with people interested in sharing thoughts and ideas for food safety activities. Well, there is a discussion forum at the IFSQN. Um, 
you know, in fact, there's a topic on this actual webinar, so uh, you can carry on the discussion there. I'll put the link in the follow-up email. Um, James Delamere, David, as always, great presentation. Where do we start? Hmm. It's the next training. Next time we do training, get good refreshments, put on some music, use some videos, and greet the people and have fun. Uh, play a game. Yeah, exactly. Just Make yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Kyriakos, what if the majority of your employees are technologically challenged, like they still use flip phones and have a hard time with tablets? Okay. Um, anything that has, we're talking about classroom training using the participal or pull everywhere. Um, these tools allow people to use um, text messages still. You can still text. People still do that. Um, it's a possibility. Also, some of the, the you can obtain, um, and some of the companies will sell clickers. For instance, um, we have, um, uh, we work with groups who don't use smartphones for religious reasons at all. Mm -hmm. um, so in those kind of classrooms, if we want to engage, we can do just, you know, ha raise your hand polling or um, use uh, um, clickers. Um, okay. Some companies do provide clickers. I think, I'm not sure, I don't want to talk on behalf of the Poll Everywhere people. I think Poll Everywhere also has a clicker solution for places where where you can't use smartphones. Some of our, um, I, I, don't, I don't only do f food safety training. Sometimes I do quality um, training in places that don't deal with food, sometimes in environments that are um, a security, uh, um, that have security restrictions um, for reasons of confidentiality, confidentiality, and you can, they don't have smartphones at all. So there we'll use clickers. Okay. Uh, a good question from Michael. Using this type of presentation, how do you show evidence that you covered all the required material for, for example, a GFSI auditor? Great question. Um, Participable allow you to save your um, results. So, if, for instance, if while you're going through a presentation, you're asking questions, people are answering. Um, you can actually use that record as a tra as an effective a training effectiveness record and show it. Um, you can have an examination at the end with uh, using polling or just a written exam. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the the material itself is covered. We don't skip material, but it's just delivered in a, in a way that's uh, that's fun. Yeah, it was funny that uh, when you was doing your presentation, um, for example, when you was on a slide and it was just, uh, I can't remember what it said, but just a small image in the corner, and you was talking and talking probably for, I don't know, it could have been three, four minutes with just this image, and people were typing in the sidebar, the slides are not moving, the slides are not moving, because I think people expect and they're used to training and presentations where almost all of the text is on every slide that's being spoken. But that isn't the way, you know, you know what I'm saying? It isn't the way yes. you do it. I, I, I've, and I, talk, I, did, I did mention that, yes. I, if you, if, you, have a, if you, are, you have a lot of words that you want people to use, give handouts, um, send emails. I, I, it's, people don't read off a slide and then remember things. Usually the, the, the writing on the slide is for the benefit of the presenter. Um, as I said, and there are now ways to get around. You can use your cheat sheet with PowerPoint. You don't have to show everybody every word. Exactly. And so, Michael, uh, your cheat sheet or your uh, speaker notes uh, are almost evidence as well of part of the content that was covered, even though it's not on the PowerPoint, for example. Um, now, Virginia says that the, the team is silent. They rarely answer group questions. Um, they're quiet and shy. Um, one of the ways that we get around that is, first of all, to work in small groups um, so we can get to everybody and talk to them and be tender and nice with them. Um, we never you know, shame people. But when you're doing using your smartphone, that's a way of people usually don't like to speak up. They can also participate through their smartphone. So it's also a way of getting them engaged without having without people sometimes are embarrassed. Um, in most groups, you'll find a variety of different people. So you'll have the ones that are more noisy. And a whole team that's quiet. Um, I haven't never came across that, so I have to see what's going on. Okay, uh, Amit, um, how can we make training of SOPs interactive? Any ideas? Um, yes, uh, I've done some of that, but I more and more understand that SOPs, um, people should read them. Um, 
and then talk about them and not teach them. I, I don't believe that a trainer could stand in front of a classroom and read out an SOP um, if the people know how to read. If they don't know how to read, that's a different story. Then then, then, then it's it's worth going over this SOP, um, in which case um, what I'll do is I'll take an SOP, for instance, that has uh, five clauses, break the class up into five little groups, and each team is going to train everybody else about, about part of the SOP. So they, have, so they have 15 minutes to read their section and, 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 and find out a way how they're going to teach everybody else. And then everybody teaches everybody else. Um, and, of course, the, the, the presenter is there to, to mediate and to add on. Um, so it makes it interactive and people get engaged and, and they don't just listen to a boring lecture sitting. And, and always, always have to – I didn't talk about this. I didn't mention it. I should have. Um, always make sure people in a classroom are not sitting in rows facing you. That's not the way we teach anymore. That's uh, old school. Uh, people should be in, in, in groups. They should be around tables um, or in a semicircle. They should see each other. Um, the presenter is not the issue in modern uh, learning. Yeah. Um, Robert, just, Robert Brown is just making a point. Your earlier remark on teaching the, the why determines success or failure of any educational training. You know, why, why are we doing this? Definitely. Okay. Uh, any more questions while we've got David? We've got a few minutes left. Uh, any further questions? Um, and you can obviously re-watch re this and, and the video. And okay. I, I do yeah. want to answer Molly. If that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, what should the time limit be for training session? Um, I we I managed to hold a, to to do effective training for ninety minute trainings, um, no more. Um, often we'll do thirty minutes, but but by the time, time everybody gets sitting down, uh, then we. But ninety minutes is a good time if you if you have fun in games, not lecturing. Ninety minutes lecture, nobody will, no worker can sit through. Yeah, and then in general, you recommend that smaller, more frequent trainings. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, Stephanie's, uh, Stephanie Smith, for some SLPs, SLPs, I have made videos of the task and added the text directly from the SLP. That's great. If you have that resource, that's great. Yeah. yeah nothing, like, nothing like watching a, a movie of something instead of listening about it. Okay. Yeah, well, I hope you got, uh, I'm sure you did, lots of you have said, uh, lots of ideas, creative ideas that at, at the end of the day are going to make uh, make uh, the training more effective and interesting and engaging for everybody. Because uh, I know I, I've done training uh, in the past and there's nothing worse as a presenter when you don't really believe in the content yourself. It's, you know it's bore, boring and you're trying to deliver it, you know. Uh, yeah. No, good. Okay. Right. Well, if you do have further questions, you can always add them on the, the forum and we'll pass them on to David. Uh, but yeah, fantastic, Dave. David. Okay. Thank have you. everybody have a great weekend and see you on Food Safety Friday soon. Yeah. Thanks, David. Cheers. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, that was David Rosenblatt from um, Share Consulting and Training. Um, I've loaded your certificate in the sidebar. Um, all you have to do is click the download now button. That will open Dropbox. And then you print and sign your name on it yourself, or you can edit it in an image editing package and add your, your name. I can't personalize them uh, myself because 1,500 people have registered, so it's not possible. I will promise to follow up with a, an email with the recording, the slides, and the certificate, a link to the discussion topic on the IFS brand where you can carry on with your ideas and your discussions together, and also David's contact details in case you need to contact him. Uh, next week, we have uh, sustainable food production uh, with Tom Gosselin from DA, DNV GL Business Assurance. Uh, I've enjoyed today. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, training. Uh, yeah, Friday, best day of the week. Have a, have a wonderful weekend, and uh, we'll see you next week.
Take care. Bye.